I would like to thank Miss um, Bass for such a very undeserved and flattering introduction. Um, I was advised by a friend while I was preparing this um, statement that the, the mark of a successful speech is for the speaker to be able to stop speaking before his audience stops listening. I would like to indulge you to just um, be patient with me this evening because I thought um, I would sort of extend my speech a bit because for the first time I actually have the cabinet present and listening to me together. So I need to take advantage of this because it's a once in a lifetime opportunity. So please bear with me if I seem to be a little long and I don't stick to my, my plan to finish before you stop listening. Your Excellency, Sir Edmund Wickham Lawrence, Governor General of St. Kitts and Nevis, the Right Honorable Dr. Denzil Douglas, Prime Minister, Your Lordship, Justice Dasham Ramdani, Resident Judge, other members of the Federal Cabinet, Parliament, Sir Cuthbert Sebastian, former Governor General, Dr. Dwight Venner, Governor of the Central Bank, and I see so many familiar faces. I would perhaps like to spend the rest of the evening just um, saluting you, but forgive me and know that I'm thinking of you. And I would also like to welcome the members of the Diplomatic and Consular Corps. I am delighted to participate in this 15th annual Prime Minister's Independence Lecture Series which this year emphasizes the importance of stability, credibility, and prosperity as we celebrate 20, 30 years of independence. I see this anniversary as a signal moment for us to rise to the opportunities and challenges of our time and to honor the work and sacrifices of those men and women who came before us and on whose shoulders we stand today. I know that this is a lecture series, but please indulge me if I attempt not to lecture to you, but to engage you. Some of what I will say here tonight will perhaps not be completely new to most of you, only that my appreciation of these things have been shaped by my worldview and seasoned by my own mosaic of experiences. I feel especially privileged to be able to share these thoughts and perspectives with you as part of what I hope will be an ongoing dialogue in our collective effort to fulfill our nation's destiny. Permit me at the outset to recognize the Right Honorable Prime Minister for his steadfast work and solid leadership during the last two decades. I continue to be impressed. I continue to be impressed by the commitment which motivates you and your cabinet ministers who take on the continuously demanding and often thankless roles of public office. Yet no less is required in order to sustain growth, prosperity, resilience, and transform St. Kitts and Nevis into a modern society. I know that you have done this work with an abiding faith in an, an unflattering and unfaltering sorry, pledge to the citizens of St. Kitts and Nevis. Today's theme, Far Beyond Symbolism, is an important backdrop for our young people whose skills, talents, and strengths we need to re-energize our continuing national journey. And it is within this context that I wish to engage you this evening and perhaps to challenge your very own perceptions of what independence means. Therefore, for the purposes of, of tonight's presentation, I would look briefly at the history of our federation with its inherent imperfections and strengths. I will also highlight some of the many national accomplishments and peer at the opportunities and challenges before us as a young nation acting and competing in a global marketplace and conclude by offering you some perspective on our way forward. To get started, ladies and gentlemen, it would not be inappropriate for me to argue that in a way, an imperfect federation chose St. Kitts and Nevis. But by our efforts, we are succeeding at perfecting that union. This country's federal history was minted in Great Britain more than 400 years ago. At, at that time, the prevailing assumption was that small colonies, which were then agricultural outposts, 
and which had small land masses and populations, limited or no natural resources, were not viable as separately administered territories. To them, the ultimate strength and prosperity of these colonies lay not in their separate identities, but in political union. Federation therefore became a reactive response to political expediency and the need for an effective system of remote political administration of the islands. Given, given the prevailing mindset at the time, as early as 1671, the islands of St. Kitts and Nevis were federated with Antigua and Montserrat into a Leeward Islands government. This would last until 1806. A second federal attempt lasting until 1871 saw the union of Antigua, Montserrat, St. Kitts, Nevis, and Anguilla, but that too failed. Then by federal act, the United Kingdom created a federation of St. Kitts, Nevis, and Anguilla in 1882, and the islands were granted the same laws, administrative councils, and privileges. The continued insistence on regional federalism saw the integration of St. Kitts, Nevis, and Anguilla into a larger Leeward Island Federation from 1871 to 1956. In 1958, the region-wide West Indies Federation was created. That union collapsed in 1962. Nevertheless, not to be dissuaded by failure, in 1967, at UK insistence, St. Kitts, Nevis, and Anguilla became a self-governing associated state of Britain. This experiment was problematic from its inception and ended poorly. Suffice it to say, Anguilla seceded in 1980 and remains a, a British colony today. The remainder of that union, the Federation of St. Kitts Nevis, it, as it would become known, achieved full political independence from the United Kingdom on September 19, 1983. The evolution of the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis was slow, if not to a tortuous process, which I believe greatly influenced its current constitution, which describes the Federation as having two principal constituents, the island of St. Kitts and the island of Nevis, with the federal seat of government in St. Kitts and a local government on Nevis. This constitution, like the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis, is a creature of a shared history, a common understanding of its contemporary political circumstances, and importantly, a reflection of the will of its people. It has become the exception that proves the rules and, and clearly shows that federal instruments do not necessarily have to be unyielding and static. A viable and effective federalism will always likely take the shape, priorities, and political realities of its constituent unit. To further explore my thesis, let me um, share with you a classic definition of federalism, which describes it as being a political construct intended to divide power equally between constituent units and to provide for the distribution of power that cannot be unilaterally altered by either member or of the unit or a central authority. Given this definition, and based on our experience here in St. Kitts and Nevis, we can all agree that true federalism is essentially an ideal. Yet whilst I would be first to agree that St. Kitts and Nevis's federal model does not rise to the classic example, I believe strongly that for any constitution to be valid, it must be informed by the political realities of the day represent the legitimate concerns of the citizens and live as a practical framework through which a country and its people can prosper. Undoubtedly, one can point to 19, the 1998 secession and, and, and the agitations in 2003 as contradictions, to which I would say that the true strength of any federation is revealed most vividly, not in the good times, but in the times of greatest stress, and, and point further to the fact as seen all around the world, that criticisms and obstacles to federalism come not only from its limitation, but from the fact that, the, that at moments of great internal stress, federal, federalism quickly becomes a lightning rod for opposing forces. Yet we can say that in 1998, this very constitution worked. Though in stark contrast to the classic example that I gave you, it remains a living, breathing instrument which hopefully one day could be a standard by which dependable, pragmatic, and predictable forms of regional federalism is pursued. And it is through these lenses, ladies and gentlemen, that I want our young people to understand that talks or agitations towards secessions does not necessarily weaken the federation. On the contrary, it gives teeth to its instruments. I want you to understand 
that St. Kitts and Nevis is the smallest country in the Western Hemisphere, despite occasional internal political disruptions and external challenges, continues to prosper and has thrived as a federation for three decades. And so I stand here tonight and say to you that St. Kitts and Nevis is moving forward in spite of the differences, and that 30 years showed demonstrably that as a nation, the growth of our country, the attainment of prosperity, and the realization of our shared vision are greater than the individual differences and personal ambition. Quite remarkably, ladies and gentlemen, and perhaps counterintuitively, federalism in St. Kitts and Nevis works, and this is why we're celebrating 30 years of political independence. I want our young people to embrace this legacy and to build on it because I believe strongly that when one finds a legal framework as we have done in St. Kitts and Nevis, which captures the right balance of laws and obligations, objectives and aspirations, rights and responsibilities, we move that much closer to that perfect federal reality. While you digest these thoughts, I, I invite you to reflect with me on a few of the accomplishments in St. Kitts and Nevis. The, as you go around Sinkis, the evidence of the, the development, the growth is paramount, so I won't get into all the details because I think I would, I'm trying to catalog it. I'm, I would probably um, take up most of the evening, but you'll forgive me if I highlight just a few. It is worth prefacing that the, um, these by stressing that from the days of slavery to emancipation, from trade union activism to political independence, St. Kitts and Nevis's resolve has been tempered and steel by challenged and buoyed by the vision of its leaders and the resilience of its people. Progress has come, but it was never easy, and, and it had a cost. The country has had to endure the demise of the sugar industry, catastrophic natural disaster with damages exceeding half a billion US dollars. It has also had to endure high indebtedness linked to natural disaster reconstruction and the need to sustain growth in the face of constant vulnerability to external factors. So uh, when you put all this into proper context, one readily appreciates that though significant, the attainment of nationhood, which was just the start of a very epic journey, was really only a start. Yet the St. Kitts and Nevis you see today is dramatically different from the St. Kitts and Nevis of the 1980s. In 30 years, St. Kitts and Nevis has transformed socially. <laughs> In 30 years, St. Kitts and Nevis has transformed socially, economically, and in the infrastructural development terms. In the human development indices, which, which are very important to me, um, we have had such dramatic growth that St. Kitts and Nevis was graduated by the international community to the level of a high-income, non-OECD country. But progress, like I said, had a cost. As a result of its continued growth, Access to concessional funding virtually disappeared, and in large part, St. Kitts and Nevis has had to fend for itself. Nevertheless, the fact that we can speak of sustainable progress despite obvious obstacles stands as a forceful testament to how far this country and its people have come through visionary leadership, commitment, and hard work. Such vision and commitment, ladies and gentlemen, are the cornerstones of policies of modernization seen here in St. Kitts and Nevis and, and witnessed around the island. But I would like to, when I speak of progress, I want to look at some of the development indices. In 1983, the per capita GDP for St. Kitts and Nevis stood at $1,334.94 US dollars. Ten years later, it stood at 4,793, and in 2003, it was $9,881.76. Last year, 2012, despite the effects of a debilitating global recession, which inevitably led to contraction in domestic ac economic activity, St. Kitts and Nevis's GDP per capita grew to over 14,500 US dollars. What this means is that St. Kitts and Nevis is now ranked number 75 by world comparison. Likewise, according to the UNDP Development Index, which looks at health, education, and income, 
St. Kitts and Nevis is, is ranked 72 out of 187 countries, placing it above the average for Latin America and the Caribbean. Another noteworthy advance is that whereas in 1980, life expectancy at birth was 65 years, today, life expectancy at birth stands at 73.3 years. Another important indicator is the growth of, in private land and home ownership. The rationalization of laws and the availability of lands have meant that a much wider and representative cross-section of citizens have access to land, making it possible for them to realize their implicit birthright and to build their own homes. This availability of land has also given rise to a discernible growth in the agriculture and livestock farming sector and is enabling several farmers to move from previously unregulated farmings on small plots of land, sometimes as squatters, to larger, more productive farms. At the level of physical infrastructure, the island's road networks continue to be upgraded and modernized, and many communities have paved roads and appropriate street lightings. As part of the modernization exercise, the creation of community sports centers, play fields, um, underscore the government's recognition of the value of sports in education and for education and its impact on the young people of this country. The extensive renovation of Warner Park and the building of track and fields not only improved the image of St. Kitts and Nevis as a venue for international sporting activities, but also improved the international chances of our young athletes by giving them better training facilities at home. I can go on for the rest of the evening reminding you of the ways in which St. Kitts and Nevis has become a sustainable template for success. But I will turn instead to the assortment of challenges and opportunities and some of the things we might do to ensure that this country lives out its promise and achieves its fullest potential. In terms of challenges, I begin with the issue of public security, in particular the phenomenon of youth violence. It is critical that we address this phenomenon of youth violence because it ensnares one of our most critical national resource, our young, whose integral and pivotal role in the future prosperity of this country is undeniable. The real issue is not whether we attribute the evolving phenomenon of youth violence, the ubiquity of cable televisions, the violent subculture of electronic gaming, the infectious phenomenon of in instant gratification where everything must be had now, even if, the means, if it means resorting to illegitimate means to get it, or the growing gang culture where disputes are settled through violence. The critical fact is that whether separately or together, they make an already complex problem worse. Therefore, in order to secure the hard-fought prosperity, the public, private and, private, and civic sectors should collaborate in a holistic and structured way to engage our young, to hear from them. They are our future, after all. We it's our responsibility to teach and guide them, but we have a, a duty to listen to them as well. One way of dealing with this problem, I believe, is through combined action which addresses the lack of skills among some of the youth. Thankfully, government has, has taken meaningful steps to address the situation, but a collective approach focused primarily on young males is necessary. Schools and colleges should find innovative ways of engaging our youngsters and making the curriculum more attractive adaptive to the orientation, and rewarding enough to stem the potential for dropouts. Another serious challenge, ladies and gentlemen, which is close to my heart, is that of the increasing incidence of NCDs, non-communicable diseases. A World Bank study has warned that St. Kitts and Nevis is facing a health crisis with rising rates of heart disease, diabetes, obesity, cancer, and other communicable diseases. Although these diseases were traditionally um, tending to affect disproportionately poor families, today, unfortunately, they have become equal opportunity offenders with side effects uh, of long-term disability and prem premature death. In the past, these diseases, um, such as diabetes, were associated with people of my parents' generation or older. Today, these diseases affect even the very young. I've, you might ask why I'm talking about um, NCDs, but I singled it out because I believe that the progress of this country that this country has made on several levels could easily unravel in the face of an NCDs e epidemic. But we are not without options. The advice suggests that policymakers have a tremendous opening through which to take action to interrupt and break the vicious cycle by establishing appropriate public policies to improve um, people's quality of life and to encourage our people to make appropriate choices. 
And because these are by and large lifestyle diseases, our young people must become re relentless soldiers in the battle to preserve your quality of life, that of your parents and your nation. We each have the power to determine whether we want, what we want to eat, whether we're going to smoke, exercise, drink, or whether we're going to change our lifestyles. I want our young people who are very taken in with this with the, 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 the games and the internet, and so they become inactive and lead sedentary, sedentary lifestyle, I want to challenge these young people to enjoy your video games, but to exercise your minds, to try and understand how do these games work? How do you become game developers and not just end users? Address your minds to the idea of reverse engineering. You can develop an app to deal with the, the, the issue of, um, to count calories, to deal with the issue of obesity, exercise, and you, you can focus on reverse engineering the impact of non-communicable diseases by making an affirmative choice. The power to create and to re-engineer lies in your hands. Fortunately, NCDs are largely preventable and the onset can be delayed by reducing the main behavioral risks. By the same token, prosperity is a lifestyle decision. The choice is simple, a nation's health is a nation's wealth. Another important challenge, which, is, which also is an opportunity, is how do we improve national competitiveness? Like many of you, I believe in the promise of St. Kitts and Nevis. As one of its diplomats interacting at various, with various ministries and businesses locally, and interacting and responding to calls from businessmen and people from around the world who are interested in doing business in St. Kitts and Nevis, I am fully aware of the plethora of opportunities, the resilience, and the hard work of my fellow nationals, of our proud history, the credible and stable institutions, democratic traditions, and good govern governance, which give me reason for optimism. But these days, my optimism is further emboldened by the fact that at no other time in modern history did the possibility exist, even remotely, where a tiny country like St. Kitts and Nevis with a population of about 50 to 1,000 could even consider competing successfully with its neighbors, let alone taking on larger, resource-rich countries with populations in the tens of millions. Today, however, this is more than possibility. The, this country's destiny is being fashioned by a new and dynamic century. These young people are the generations of the information and knowledge revolution. Unlike the agricultural revolution and the industrial revolution, which required huge capital inputs, large work workforces, large amounts of land and infrastructural support, this new information century operates in the clouds on bandwidth across wide and wireless infrastructure. And instead of traditional re real estate, it calls for real creativity and innovative thinking. It thrives on free enterprise, free spirit, and entrepreneurship, no longer bricks and mortars, but the bricks of strategic policy planning and strong motor of determination. In today's new world, a business, a factory, a workforce can just as easily competitively, competitively and successfully operate from a basement, a garage, or a living room. The knowledge century has ushered in unprecedented opportunity through which a convergence of strategic public policy private public sector partnerships, skills development, and adapting technology to one's need can see a small country like St. Kitts and Nevis transform itself into a, um, from a consumer to an innovator and producer. Competitiveness in the pursuit of prosperity, ladies and gentlemen, has been simplified. It is now as much about the competition of ideas, of knowledge generation, and knowledge-based consumables as it is about policy agility, e-government planning. It is the century of the young. Therefore, the idea that civil servants are somehow purely government bureaucrats is an anachronism. A modern St. Kitts and Nevis seeking to, com to operate competitively in this new knowledge century calls for a progressive, retooled, creative thinking civil service as adept at public administration as to providing tailored service to international clients at the speed of business. The civil service has to see itself as a cohesive team on the front line for planning, implementation, and for shepherding new technology and techniques into a viable tool for greater prosperity and social transformation. These civil servants must seamlessly grasp and promote the synergies and linkages between agriculture and tourism, 
as well as to appreciate how to collect, interpret, and analyze statistics. It falls to civil servants to appreciate that the world outside does not wait for St. Kitts and Nevis to catch up. It calls on government to prioritize modern employment practices and training policies to ensure optimal outcome. Another challenge embedded with opportunities rests on the relationship between the public and private sector. One of the major policies of government in the last decade has been its strategic decision to diversify away from the sugar-dependent economy with its outdated economic model based on, a declining, sh sugar, on declining sugar prices and eroding preferential uh, European market access. The future will require even bolder leadership and collaboration to navigate the turbulent financial and economic headwinds. Understandably, this government has prioritized serv the services sector. On, um, and year on year, growth in services as a factor of bilateral and world trade continues to take on greater global economic significance. And cross-border trade in services make up one-fifth of the world trade. As this global recession retreats, there is significant scope for further development and growth in the sector. To maximize these types of offering, St. Kitts and Nevis must re-energize and expand collaboration and convergence within the public and private sector. In moving forward, strategic private-public partnerships are not optional. They are a sine qua non. In, in the context of new partnerships, ladies and gentlemen, while I can speak at length to the benefits of the citizenship, citizenship by investment program and the Sugar Investment Diversification Foundation. For the purposes of this narrative, I want to say that, the, that this initiative holds tremendous value for the current and future development of St. Kitts and Nevis. We are... <laughs> we already witness a lot, much of the the growth that has come about as a result of the collaboration between St. Kitts and Nevis um, government through SIDF and the private sector. I can refer to um, recent developments, but you're all familiar with this. Um, what I, the program currently enjoys tremendous international appeal. As an economic vehicle, it has served to stimulate growth and is already facilitating transformation on the national economic and social levels. If I may, this program was established in 1984 and it is being copied around the world. Incidentally, it's the oldest of its kind globally and it's almost as old as independence. But what, what fascinates me and is most important for me about the program and the SIDF is, this, is its scope for transformative good and for the powerful enabling role that it can play as an incubator for private business, social development and prosperity. The SIDF, though a component of the program, has been a vital support, uh, support for to the tourism sector through investment, the social sector through employment and other safety net programs, and education through scholarships. It holds great potential as a sovereign fund as well. In addition to providing support to local businesses and first-time homeowners, it can also provide venture capital support to finance creative projects by our young people. It can... It can be encouraged to provide seed capital to fund technologies and techniques to build support for apps and smartphones, video games, electronic components, and other consumer items. It can also support training programs to help youth at risk and provide investment in critical skills development programs to ensure long-term competitiveness, sustainability, and installed human resource capacity. Furthermore, the creation of web-based application is another area where collaboration between the young people, the public, and private sector can become mutually beneficial and profitable. Initiatives such as these can help spawn a new generation of tech-savvy productive businesses and generate income for high-tech consumer products from trademarks, patents, and intellectual property, which in itself will also open up another avenue for our young people to develop the relevant skills to support the institutional, academic, legal, and regulatory frameworks for trade and intellectual property rights. But none of this holds any relevance, ladies and gentlemen, without the right type of education. I'm a strong proponent of rigor rigorous, relevant, relationship-based ed education and training. Education for the 21st century demands that people think creatively and critically and know how to solve problems. They must communicate effectively, orally, and in writing. 
Be team players, show leadership, professionalism, long, lifelong commitment to learning, and demonstrate diversity and knowledge of information technology applications. Education in the 21st century is an opportunity for the private and civic sectors to collaborate with government to ensure that the academic agenda accommodates their goals and perspectives, and these sectors can do much more to collaborate in, in creating internships. Internships, apprenticeships are extremely important for young people because it gives them relevant experience by confirming the relationship between the real world and academic theories. They also ensure that the workforce and society which emerges will bring with it the quality of skills and mindset that meet the private sector's growth in objectives, the country's civic awareness agenda, and national prosperity. This calls for pragmatic collaboration in the development of apprenticeship programs geared towards raising the skills and productivity productivity level of future workers. It is at this critical juncture that, true, that the true meaning of partnership can generate the best results, allowing the public and private and civic sector to turn eager, inspired learners into competitive, productive, and disciplined partners. Initiatives in the spirit of the PEP program and the, um, can work as vehicles for skills development and entrepreneurship as well as creating a workforce to meet the needs of a modern society. But it requires input from all sides. Young people must see these types of initiatives as legitimate opportunities to acquire valuable life skills and experience and to improve their lives. It is in the interest of employers to support them, and employers must guard against seeing this merely as a pool of cheap labor, which allows them to limit their responsibility to their older workers. Additionally, in building a more competitive, service-driven economy, the schoolhouses of today can no longer be viewed purely as assembly lines churning out um, end-of-year passes. They are to become nimble, state-of-the-art, clearing houses of talent for updated information as well as for modern skills and career development. The schoolhouses ought to be as much about preparing the young for a career in a fiercely competitive global arena as it is for meeting the academic ambitions of individual students and the dreams of their parents. It bears repetition, ladies and gentlemen, that schools should not only train youngsters for success at school and university, but also for careers and for life. Therefore, although traditional roles remain important, schools should also be workshops for knowledge creation and for infecting young minds with a greater appreciation of the value of math and science as essential ingredients for success in the knowledge revolution. Teachers, too, will need to update or acquire new skills to improve their ability to help drive the creation of the knowledge society in St. Kitts and Nevis. Through them, our youngsters will recognize that computers in a classroom and access to the internet are not ends in and of themselves, but merely routine and necessary tools for creative thinking and success in this knowledge century. Ladies and gentlemen, as I begin to uh, my conclusion, I'd like to share some perspective with you. I want to assure you that these are not just the thoughts or the reflections of a naive optimist. They flow from the fact that I am a child of this nation, a beneficiary of its traditions and promise, and a stakeholder in its incredible future. I believe in us, and I believe in Saint, that St. Kitts and Nevis is poised to progress by leaps and bounds. But I also believe firmly that we must work together and that we are destined to rise and fall together as one people, one nation. I am alive to the very robust political debates and vocal disagreements that, I, that have been taking place in St. Kitts, but these are the hallmark of a vibrant, living, breathing democracy, and I encourage it. But we must always remember to balance political activism with civic responsibility. Differences of opinion cannot be allowed to obscure the imperative and the merits of nationhood and what that implies. We We must strive to fulfill the promise of independence, one nation bound together with a common destiny. As I reflect on some of the personal stories framed by the legacy and character of this great little country, I see the promise unfolding. I think of a young lady from a village in Nevis who has served at very senior levels in, the pri in private enterprise and public service, and who is today helping to shape the hemispheric policies on development. 
I think of a young lady from Sadler's who I see in the audience today and a young man from Sandy Point who went off to Cuba and returned as psychologist and physician, respectively. I think of a young man I saw last month when I was here in St. Kitts at the, the, the demonstration farm speaking in fluent Mandarin. These are your stories, your lives, your promise. These are the children of families whose stories of lacking in wherewithal could have completely muted their prospects and faith in the future. Yet today, through the support of government and strategic policies, they are able to live out the promise as medical doctors, many with specialization, some as entrepreneurs, and others as business people, nurses, and teachers. Indeed, we should emphatically applaud ourselves for the achievement of the last 30 years, but let's do this with our eyes focused on the next 30 years, hungry for personal and national success. I want to stress and remind our young people that government alone is not responsible for prosperity. We all are. Each of us is the face of growth, the expression of credibility, and the foundation of national stability and the seeds for future prosperity. Each petition and division has a stake in this federation's promise and shares responsibility for its internal unity or flaws. We must demand more of ourselves, our churches, our government, our institutions, teachers, service providers, security forces, and fellow citizens. As co-creators of an unfolding national destiny and a journey far from complete, I encourage you to celebrate this historic occasion, but with the responsibility that nationhood implies. We coexist today in a truly interconnected space. We live in a time where despite our small size, we are competing with larger developed countries. Our strongest competition may be several time zones away. Business partners may be down the street or on another continent, but notably, opportunities for growth and personal development also exist at home in St. Kitts and Nevis in sectors yet to be defined. I am sure if you gaze around this hall, your eyes will likely cross paths with those of a future apps developer, a leader of a local business, a restauranter, or perhaps the next high commissioner, another big thinker, innovator, or an aspiring politician. To you, young ladies and gentlemen, I challenge you to think creatively of the possibilities and opportunities which await you on the journey called life. I urge, you in, I urge you that instead of worrying about finding a job, to prepare yourselves to become the next employer who can marshal the factors of production and generate economic, economic activity here in St. Kitts, or even to take full advantage of the partial scope agreement recently signed with Brazil. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, we see around us signs of prosperity. Our country and our institutions are stable and credible. But tomorrow, St. Kitts and Nevis needs all our energies. There is still much work to be done. We must pool our, pool our skills and resources and stand on deck ready to steady the ship of state. I believe that the task of expanding our prosperity and maintaining stability and credibility needs all of us. A huge opportunity named St. Kitts and Nevis is knocking, ladies and gentlemen. I pray to God that we are each alive to our strengths and seize the moment with creative optimism, national self-awareness, pride, and confidence. Happy 30th anniversary. Congratulations. And thank you.